Hello and welcome. This is Home Life for Extraordinary Impact. Where we explore global perspectives on home in order to help you create a home life where you consistently grow, deeply connect, and powerfully impact the world around you. We're Matt and Lindsay Barrios. We'll be your host today. And today's a special episode because we want to give you a taste of what you'll get if you become a premium subscriber. Um, usually episodes like this are going to be for premium subscribers only, but today is... We're feeling super extra generous. We're feeling extra generous. Also, full disclosure... We have one premium <laughs> subscriber at this point. We're also we also like just launched, so like I'm not ashamed of that one bit. Um, but you want to become a premium subscriber. That's the point. So I, wait till you hear today's special episode. Uh-huh, so uh-huh. what are what are we going to do today? Okay, okay. So today, um, as we, as we set up in kind of like that intro episode or whatever, what we're doing on these premium episodes is I'm telling you some of the big insights that I'm discovering through doing all this research, right? right. And, and so there's three big insights that I think are big takeaways for way people's, uh, ways people can do home life that I'm getting from interviewing experts and everyday people all, all around the world, right? So that's what you and I are going to discuss. We're going to go one yeah. by one, Great. each of them. So I'll get to ask, we'll get to hear, I'll get to learn from you, kind mm-hmm. of gleaning from all these interviews, what what are like the three things that kind of come up from it? And then yes. are we, we get to talk about then it, we right? Chat. Then we, we chat. get to talk about how that applies to us. Exactly, because I want all of these insights not just to be, you know. Esoteric, oh, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, oh, what a cool idea. Yeah. No, like the important thing is that insights can be actionable and things that we actually put into our lives and and personal right it's and like personal right know. so yeah so that we can actually improve the quality of our life at home so that's that sounds wonderful Great. Does that sound good? well yeah. i'm excited to learn about from the interviews that you've done so far kind of the things that are percolating to the top like i think it's really interesting to have the variety of experiences that you're talking to um the people and places that they're coming from and then see like okay what's what are those themes what are the things that are coming out of that so matt what what have you noticed so far yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm pulling on themes. At this point, I've interviewed um, a dozen people, right? But we've only posted, um, a, and, and that's like the formal interviews, then I'm just having conversations nonstop with people about this all the time too. But like in terms of formal podcast interviews, 12 people, but I'm going to only be gleaning, uh, like focusing on insights from the first four interviews Great. that I've actually posted already. So that's like talking to Melika in Iran, uh, talking to Rob, who lives in Phoenix, uh, talking to uh, Brian, who is in Vermont, but is a Danish wood furniture maker, and okay. then talking to um, Ali, who's up in Toronto. So I'm just looking at those four as like a little section to compare with one another, like splicing their answers, seeing what emerges is interesting, all of that. And there's one, the, let's talk about the first big insight that I found. Yeah, really let's talk about it. What, what was the first thing that kind of stands out to you from those those four people? So the first thing that I found is that the way that we talk about feeling at home, uh-huh. here's what we actually mean by that. Interesting. What we mean. What do we mean? What we mean when we say we're feeling at home is that our inner world, mm-hmm. our personality, our mood, our values, those things that happen inside our own minds, Yeah. that is aligned with our external environment. Okay. All right. So. And that's what we mean when we say that we feel at home. Exactly. Hmm. So if we want to feel at home in our homes, which no <laughs> doubt, <we> everybody do. <laughs> wants to feel at home in their homes, right? Then we actually need to know ourselves yeah. well enough, right? So that it's not by Someone else's home isn't going to make me feel at home necessarily. Well, you know, what's weird is like sometimes it does because you you find resonance, like the person that you are finds resonance with this moment that you're visiting somebody's place. And it's because it's connecting with your personality. It's connecting with your values, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, What were some examples of like how that came up, I guess, in this research and these conversations? Yeah, how did that surface? What emerged for me doing these interviews were listening for the values that people had that were, you know, below the surface. I had to kind of like read between the lines often in the interviews. But there's different values that people had. For example, Ali was like very, very all about family. Yeah. And like her kind of spiritual faith, right? Those were like two standout things that she cared about um, that she was really kind of organizing her life around those values. And first of all, I just respect like a person who has values that clear and who are then like making their home about that. Integrating that into every part. Yeah, exactly. And so that's like one example, but others, it's these other kind of philosophical perspectives, like these ideas about how life can be. So in my conversation with Brian, we were chatting about the different, uh, you know, the the principles behind Danish wood furniture making. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> well, it was so interesting, such an interesting conversation with Brian. I loved it. And one of the things that emerged from that is this idea that uh, these Danish wood furniture principle, uh, wood furniture design principles, yeah. such as the joints are hidden. There's over this very clean, minimalistic look. You you create something that'll last a lifetime, right? And then pass mm-hmm. down through generations. Yeah. What was interesting in that conversation was when he said, "That's not just true of 
you know, Danish furniture, it's also true of the way that people set up their homes and altogether yeah. and then how people inhabit those spaces. So he contrasted, because these days he lives in the United States, the American value for comfort. Yes. Uh, we, we like nice, cozy environments yeah. where we've got a plush couch. Giant and, couch. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, thinking yeah. of. Is the, like, couches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And, looks terrible, but it's really comfy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and like the TV is the focal point of it because we want to be entertained and, you know, yeah. cozy, whatever. My comfort. And he, uh, he described the value that uh, people in Denmark have for clean, everything's put away. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the environment feels itself perhaps a little cold, right? Mm -hmm. um, cool colors painted on the walls, this very, very sleek, minimalist furniture. But the thing that makes a home come to life is the people that come into it. Yeah. So when you host people, then, you know, this like, almost, you know, the sleek minimalist environment comes to life. And I thought that was um, a fascinating thing to to see that there's this philosophical conception around home furniture. Yeah. And then it shapes that value. shapes how people are at home. Yeah. Both how you, what you actually put in your home, it sounds like, but also kind of even the ideas of how, what home is supposed to be for, right? Is home for my own like comfort and enjoyment or is home for other people coming into it to enjoy it? Or is it both? I mean, I don't know, but that whole idea of like, what, what is our home for? Exactly. And, you yeah. know, we'll, we'll come back to this when we get to a later point um, in comparison, in comparing these, these different perspectives. But the, the foundational takeaway for me in this first insight about the importance of matching your, yeah. you know, inner person, so to speak, you know, your personality, your, uh, your values, your spirit, your whatever that is, your, your mindset to the external environment is actually really important. Hmm. And how did I'm curious, like you said that came up in the context of like what it like the feeling at home. And I think that's a phrase that like resonates with a lot of us. It's like we just want to feel at home. And there's something mm -hmm. about that, like at home feeling um, what I'm curious, like a little bit about how how did you see that play out of like these values or ideas being expressed physically, like that inner world being matched outward that like had that impact of now that's like now I feel at home. Yeah, um, well. One repeated theme also among people was how much their relationships, like the people that they love being there with yeah. them, was an important part of a place feeling like home, yeah. right? You and I get that, right? Like, and <laughs> it's a big deal. whether it's uh, Ali's willingness to possibly relocate to be when she gets married, you know, to mm -hmm. her fiance, um, or if it's uh, Brian talking about how, uh, you know, when he got married and he like, uh, met his wife, then all of a sudden his home felt a lot more like home. Like mm -hmm. other places before that significant relationship in his life mm -hmm. weren't as much of a feeling at home, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The the like yeah. connection point there is that what's revealed in relationships is the people that we most cherish and value, desire, love, yeah. right? Are the people that we consistently invest in relationship with, right? Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that if we're gonna consistently invest in relationships with people, that are, you know, that matter to us, and those people, uh, you know, live with us, then there's an alignment between what I desire, what I love, these people who I, you know, feel deeply close to, emotionally connected to, and that space. Yeah. Right? Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. It's to be kind of a shared, a shared space that maybe takes on more of, like, some of that relational depth as well, um, or mm -hmm. is made for it. It's interesting. So how do you, I mean, I'm curious, I'm still kind of wrestling with, like, okay, what does this actually mean or look like um, for me? I think your examples are really interesting, but... Thinking about us and our home, yeah, what, I guess, what are the things, and I'll, I'm thinking about this, but what are the things that you imagine right off the bat that either we do that makes it feel like home or that we don't do that might make you feel more like home if we yeah, did? Yeah. Um, yeah, about kind of like matching these inner and outer worlds. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I... I'm would, curious because, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. got some stake in this. We've got stake in this, for sure. <laughs> I mean, like the truth is every person who has a home, which is I mean, almost everybody, like has stake in making their home feel like home and making it be a place where it's a place of self-expression. It's a place where you feel belonging in yourself, mm, right? Yeah. And, um, but I, as I see it, there's steps to get there, right? And the very first is actually like the classic Socrates, know thyself. Know thyself. Exactly. I was like, as you're talking, <laughs> it yes. feels like we're really where we're at is uh, look deep inside yourself. I know, right? <laughs> is it, did I know self be true? Is that Shakespeare? I can't remember. <laughs> I should know these things. I used to study this sort of stuff, but no longer. Anyways, so um, the important yeah. thing is that um, we know what matters we, yeah, we, to us and what, yeah, yeah. What we are. And I guess to put it on like tactical levels for everybody, some ways to know yourself include, <laughs> yeah, um, one, personality inventories are truly helpful for this kind of thing. Some are much better than others, right? <laughs> um, you don't, I, I've got a bone to pick with plenty of them, but you know. Uh, <laughs> you won't get into yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, 
if you do like a personality inventory that is grounded in, you know, solid research or whatever, you might find that you're a a uh, more extroverted person versus introverted person, a more conscientious person versus not, or a more neurotic person versus not, you know, whatever those things are. And the key thing is like, find the personality test that gives you results that actually connect with you and feel deeply true to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the important thing. If it holds a mirror to you and you're like, that's my reflection. That's me. Yeah, totally. Then, then that's good. It works for you. Functional. Great. Yeah. You found something that helps to show who you are. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so that would be like step one for, you know, know thyself in order to create a home life that you love. One is personality inventory, right? Mm-hmm. Like do that. Second is uh, knowing your values, right? Yeah. So um, I would say values emerge from a story in a person. So they emerge from history, from memory, from uh, things that they've learned along the way, right? So the more that you have a good grasp on your personal life story, yeah, the more you're going to see the repeated values that mm. spike up you know, yeah. consistently over time. So like an exercise to actually do this would be mm. sit down, you know, open up a fresh Google Doc or whatever, <laughs> write your life story. Or your, or your very hard copy journal, yeah, which or, I personally whatever. still use. <laughs> whatever. You know? And, uh, you know, some people are stuck in the past. Apparently. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, so think about what are those, if you want to do like the long version, just like brain dump your memories, you know, do in chronological order, just like pop, toss <laughs> this, them all this, the is re- this is the deep dive into know yourself yes, yes. right here. <laughs> here's, here's the uh, quicker version. <laughs> all right. Yeah. yeah. Um, think about the three to five stories in your life, moments in your life that had the greatest impact on who you believe that you are now. Hmm. Yeah. So those stories that you, you know, play on repeat in your head and, uh, and it seemed like it, it revealed something about you. Okay. Right. So for example, um, you yeah, know, tell us the story. Yeah, oh gosh, uh, uh, I don't know if I want to go to this one, but like, uh, I'll, I'll hint on this one. But when I was eight years old, I had like a near death uh, experience, you know, um, very traumatic, couldn't breathe, very, very scary. Um, and, you know, even talking about it right now, I'm like feeling my chest a little bit, right? But the important thing that came from that experience and why that story has so stuck with me over time is because it has so clearly put in, in view life versus death. Hmm existential questions, (laughs) you know, and would you know it? Like, I'm all about that stuff now. Like, I'm all about like, how do you, how do you truly live and not like be asleep in your life? Like, how do you, how do you actually like have a life of meaning and substance, you know, uh, cause it could go in a flash. Right. And that's, um, freaky probably to, for me to (laughs) mention casually on a podcast, but, but that's one of those stories that reveals values that I have. Yeah. Right. And I could give you, you know, two, three, four, five other ones, but you know, this is to set up each person who's listening to this, mm-hmm. you, anybody listening, is going to realize oh, I've got like a couple of stories that are the ones that I return to often yeah. that seem valuable to me. I don't do any come to mind for you or what what do you think? Oh man. I feel like You put me on the spot earlier, so now I'm gonna put you on the spot. <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> you did. I mean Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the the first thing that comes to mind um, was an experience when I was eighteen in Spain, and it really had a lot to do with my um, my faith and relationship with God, and kind of this moment of like, am I going to go for this or am I not? Sort of, and um, and some of the things I was wrestling through at the time, being like, okay, well, like, what does it really look like, like to 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 follow God? I guess was my big question. And I was like, okay, like there's the, all the other things that I might not want to do with this. And there's things that I don't know, like that I might like wrestle with, like, do I want to do that or not want to do this? But is there, is there like, what is the way forward if I want to totally go for it kind of thing? Mm -hmm. And, um, that was a very like impactful time. I mean, I I don't even know how to tell the story in a good way, (laughs) but I like climbed this little mountain. We called it a mountain. It was not a mountain. It was like a very small hill (laughs) behind uh, the place I was living, um, in Madrid and just kind of like asking this, this kind of big question of my life and, and trying to see like, okay, is this, yeah, how, how does this play out in real life if I'm, if I don't necessarily feel like it looks like, like, does it only look like selling all my possessions and moving to this place and doing this other thing? Or, because if that's what it looks like, okay, but if it doesn't, what does it look like? I think was part of my question and mm-hmm. part of the thing that I was, like, bringing um, and saying, like, okay, like, because I don't want to just kind of, I don't know, dilly-dally with this kind of, you know? So I think that, I don't know, it was a, it was a impactful time because I think part of it that comes out as, like, a value in this was, like, this really intense, like, honesty and almost challenge to God of like, if you don't show me like a way that this could actually look in my real life or like, and within a context and, and whether or not that means changing my life a lot, um, then I'm not going to, 
kind of waste my time yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to do this. Um, if yeah, if it's sort of just a thing we're talking about in some sort of like far off way, but not really mm-hmm. trying to um, live, you know. And I think that's that's something for me that the like kind of honesty of these three questions, like where are the, where is the disconnect? And I think even your question about this values brings this up. Like we have we have the values we think we have. And then we have the values that we For like sure. internalize and experienced in our life. And I think I'm very interested as a person in like knowing in this knowing yourself is also like, where is that disconnect? Like, where are the things that we think we're all about? And like, that is not how we're living our lives. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and how do we move towards greater integrity and alignment in that by being really honest and um, asking her questions and trying to like push through to that. So that's I an think, example. Oh, I think that's very interesting. And I, I mean, it makes sense that that's like a story that you would go back to because it is the path that you chose to go down in your life. Right. And like around faith and everything like that. And then next thing you know, like, uh, you know, it, there's also all of these challenges to these deeply held values. Sure. Right. And these moments of like, do I actually care about that? Do I not, you know, how much am I going to live in alignment with that or not? Sometimes it means an evolution of values. Sometimes it means, uh, being out of integrity with the things that we actually say we care about most, right? But the- Which is helpful to realize. I think sometimes we just like talk about values in such a, which actually I think is really interesting in this home conversation, how we design our homes to be that, is that we can talk about values or even personalities only in terms of like kind of these things out there, those big words, you know, like, oh, I value love. I value like generosity, you know, these kinds of things. And that's all yeah. really good and helpful, but it's like, how do we, I mean, I think that's where we came up with our, like I think we yeah. said our generosity, but our generosity, like our vision, uh, like our financial yes, yes, vision yes. as a family. Because I'm it's glad like, you're going there because that's where I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. How do we actually get this into like that value that we think that we have or that we want to have? Maybe it's an aspirational value. Yes. Um, or maybe it's deeply held, but it hasn't found its full expression yet. Um, yes. It's like, how do we move? Yeah. How do we, how do we help move it towards um, actual expression and, and being a value that's exhibited in our life? hundred percent. Yeah. And that's where I think bringing these things into definition is really important. So if step one in all this is like, know your, know your personality, step two, identify your values. What are they? What, what are the stories they emerge mm-hmm. from? Um, step three is write it down in a way that's mm-hmm. clear and memorable for you. So Google then, Docs. Yeah, on a Google Doc, for real. I mean, honestly, we have a Google Doc. That is a phenomenal Google Doc. Google Doc. And um, <laughs> it is like our, our little uh, family uh, vision statement around especially our finances, right? Yeah. Like what do we, what, how do we want to be as people when it comes to money? And do we want to be people who are amassing, greedy, whatever? Or do we want to be <laughs> generous with it? Well, let's be generous. Do we want to be um, people who are prepared financially? Yes, we want to be people who are prepared. Like these kinds of things. So we put these values mm-hmm. um, in a statement, right? And the same can be true about your home life, mm-hmm. right? So um, what I'd recommend is for you to know, okay, I want my home to be a place of self-expression, which for me looks like X, Y, and Z, yeah. because I value X, Y, and Z, yeah. right? All of a sudden, you have like a true north to align your kind home of framework, to. yeah, and to decide how to help you decide. Because I think that was one yeah. of the really helpful things with that statement for finances. It's like, yeah, we do not do it great all the time at all. So I'll just put that out there. There is definitely ways that that is aspirational. Real, yeah. <laughs> but I think it also it has been helpful when we're coming to like financial decisions and we're like, okay, how do we want to make this decision, especially big ones, of saying like, okay, well, this is what we say we're about. So that would yes. that would help us to decide how to make this decision. So I think about that with like home too. Like, okay, this is what we say we're about maybe we get all about hospitality maybe we even move into and we move things around in our apartment or we buy this couch or we don't do this or we even prioritize a space that has more of a living space than a bedroom space or you know all of those sorts of things like there might be really practical ways that as we come to those decisions not even necessarily needing to force the decisions on us but as we reach them because we all make these decisions all the time we have a way to decide yes absolutely and and then you set up your home so that like you yourself you know you are amplified as you Hmm. right and um, a, a very clear, tangible example of this, like I was like working from our kitchen table, which we are right now. Here we are. Um, Welcome. And it was just utterly cluttered all the time. I was like, I don't know, you can see the look on your face right now. And, <laughs> it, was and, really bad. and it was because like I, I needed a works, workspace, right? Because I am a very ambitious person who really values like making things happen, right? Like, yeah. and that's like important to me. And so I needed like an environment where I could easily jump into that. However, <laughs> That wasn't fully working because it, like, was, our it was our kitchen table. <laughs> so, you know, shifted it all over to this little desk space and everything. And that's just been working fantastic. And it's all the better because I don't need to like set up all my, all my like, you know, TV equipment in order to get making things happen. Right. So I'd say that's like hmm. a, a very tangible, like in the now example of sure. who I am, who I want to help myself become, like who I, mm-hmm. how I want to express myself and also, 
Yeah. You need to have like a good workplace to do that, right? Yeah. And also maybe kind of an example of like where those values, where different values come in and compete or might be in different places. And so how to like move through that, right? Because it's like, yes, you do need a space where you're not having to reset up these things every time so that there's room to kind of jump in, particularly with like limited time where the baby's asleep and like all of that, yeah. right? You got to just like, you don't have time to do all that stuff. Right. But also like there is, I have a value, for example, <laughs> of having a kitchen table yeah, that is she usable. Does. <laughs> and also having like, having distinct spaces for different things, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think a lot of us feel that with work at home or other stuff. It's like, okay, yeah. well, which spaces are going to be designated towards which values and which spaces and, and where is the blending good and where is the blending like really yes. undercutting this other thing that we want, yes, you know? So yes. I think that's a good example. I think it is a good purposes. example. Right, right, right. Totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. And the, especially if you live with people, the inevitable negotiation yes. between the way pe- different, you know, the way you are versus I am, the Absolutely. values that you have that I don't have, right? Yeah. And there's places of easy alignment. <laughs> there's places that are really not aligned. And one of the home needs to actually yeah. be a negotiation of that. Absolutely. I think one of the most, like, interesting things about forming a home with another person is that experience of, like, oh, this really matters to you and it does not matter to me. And, like, vice versa. Like, oh, I really like to sort my laundry <laughs> and wash it in the correct way based on what yep. kind of laundry it is. And, like, that does not and matter to you. I just want to toss it all in there. <laughs> and, and vice versa. Like, things, it's just inter- it's always interesting to discover um, that values are not universal. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. So that was the first one. I think we, oh, yeah. we dove into that a bit. Key point, just to yeah. land it real quick. You get to shape your home life in order to help you express yourself. And you got to know yourself yeah. in order to change your home life so that you can express yourself all the more, right? So just keep playing with that connection of knowing yourself, expressing yourself through your home, letting your home help you express yourself all the more. It's like a good echo chamber that helps like, you know, build everything up. Echo chamber, not usually used in a super positive sense, but I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's but resonant. don't, don't diminish resonant. this moment. Okay, sorry, <laughs> resonate, resonate. Yeah. It's like you get to hear the, the musical layers of the echo. Yes, that's why I said a good echo chamber. All right, okay. um, I had to distinguish it. All right, it's not just any echo chamber. All right, okay. Now let's get into the yeah, second. Yeah, so what was, what was another thing that you watched? Your second uh, thing, your right. second insight from these many conversations. Yeah, yeah, second big insight from these first few is um, I just want to make a clear case for the sentimental value of prized possessions. Okay. Right? Tell me, especially as kind of a semi-minimalist, I'm very exactly. interested to hear you say this. So tell me more about what that means. I, it's actually, honestly, like a little eye-opening for me. And um, two conversations this became clear in. Um, one was uh, the most recent conversation I posted uh, with Ali, and we were talking a little bit about how minimalism was such a trend, right? And uh-huh. It was like, so. you got to have nothing but like three black t-shirts and we had a good laugh about it, right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that was one thing. Or the same t-shirt in many colors. Yeah, that's what I do. I do the that same guy. t-shirt in many colors. <laughs> I put the one right shirt. Uh, at any rate, so um, well, yeah, like what, what I find is um, interesting about the conversation because where it went was um, we were talking about her, um, uh, her family home. So she lives in her home with her, uh, with her parents. Yep. And they are really, really tight knit, really close. And there's some things that are just like, you know, th- this is the family stuff. Yeah. And it's not about like having less. It's about having storied things hmm, interesting. that carry family history, that carry, you know, like some some sort of sentimental value to them and, and stuff. So in the, and so that's one thing. The second conversation where this was really clear was in my interview with Rob. And I asked him about his prized possessions. And he had he was so hilarious for one thing. But like he had a uh, autograph signed album cover from an Outcast album. <laughs> amazing it's so amazing right yeah. and yeah. and he himself has like been in radio for years and years so he already connects to music but he's always loved outcast as a hip-hop group he's just like that's what he what he, he says that he spent more time with outcast than anybody so it's just like his favorite band you know whatever yeah, right yeah and then um the last thing I, I asked him what does it represent to you yeah and for him it represents the way that outcast is it's in their name they're trying to do something different they're yeah. trying to stand apart from the whole the whole hip hop scene, which at that time was West Coast versus East Coast, and uh, and do their own thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and to actually be an outcast musically, and he himself, as a radio political talk show host, he says that his goal is to have a perspective that is unique mm-hmm. and it doesn't just fall into easy American political polls, right? Yeah. Um, but actually be willing to have an out- outcasted perspective on it all, which I I just thought that was such a great, interesting answer that um, honors the fact that he's kept this prized possession for, you know, years and years and years. Yeah. And what it means to him, what it represents, and what it's a daily reminder of for him, as if it's always the symbol of, Rob, mm-hmm. don't forget, you're the kind of guy who's going to have your own perspective, and you're not going to, you know, follow the crowd in either direction. Yeah. And I just thought that was uh, really, really cool. Um, so, 
Yeah. That's, that's where that's emerging from. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I think the thing that strikes me out of what you're sharing is just the idea of what you said, like a storied possession, just the idea that um, it's not just stuff that we might be attached to for any reason, but actually knowing like what the reason is. Um, and, and there's something really beautiful about even getting the opportunity, I'm sure, to, to express that um, for Rob. Or I would be really interested to hear the stories. You know, it makes me think of like, okay, yeah, we keep certain things or like people pass you're like why did they keep this you know sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> like, but you don't know the story behind it and yeah. so what gives it the value is knowing those stories and having the and also kind of the symbolic like meaning like how how does that continue to shape who you are um and what you do so what i'm hearing out of this is that my rock collection is very important <laughs> i give <laughs> Lindsay so much crap about this rock collection I basically whenever we go to some random place where there's cool rocks she will be picking them up along the hiking really path cool. on the beach whatever <laughs> And I, I really narrow it down. I only take like, like that. No, no, I only, I only take three like at a time. <laughs> the end. But, but yes, but, but I actually will say it's interesting because for many of these rocks, I'm like, oh, yes, they're so cool. One, most of it is just like a practice of like noticing on there. So I'll yeah. just share that. It's but then also in, in my, my rock collection that exists in the mason jar, um, or actually now in phase play things, because um, she loves the rock collection. Yeah, our daughter too. loves this rock collection, and it's the worst <laughs> thing for. You know, it's, it's actually great for her. And it's, she and it. it's completely justifying the whole rock collection in my mind. <laughs> so there you go. So stories can either be, either the story is known or they just get repurposed for something totally different. <laughs> but um, what I was going to say with that is that I, I have thought about that as like, okay, initially, like a few of them I like wrote on like what they were from. And there is something more, more meaningful aside from the fact that, oh, this is cool looking rock. Um, when it is a reminder of like, oh yeah, that time we did this thing on this beach with your parents and we had this like connecting time or like this experience um, that like honestly... I can't remember most of those rocks where they came from, even though in theory I was going to. But good thing Faye loves them. So it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's great. I mean, and now that's the new story for them. Like, so even if the stories behind so many of these rocks have been forgotten <laughs> at this point, and yet there is still a strange sentimental connection to the, to the forgotten stories collection, right? But uh, <laughs> but now it's like our daughter loves to play with these rocks and just like <laughs> we've got to do all we can to make sure she doesn't swallow them or whatever. But, you know, she's she just, just licks them occasionally. <laughs> she's, she's not into swallowing them. A year and a half. It's all good. So, so I'm curious for you, yeah. is there any like uh, possessions that stand out to you as being like, oh, this is symbolic or this is significant mm -hmm. storied that you want to make sure that you like value in a different kind of way? Easy answer. This painting right behind oh. us. Um, and oh, that. Know, I didn't for, even for know the, I was this is a reason to get uh, video content and, you know, watch on Spotify or YouTube for those who are just listening. But um, yeah, so my sister painted this painting uh, years ago and it, um, it was a painting that she did and she gave to me right after I went on a, you know, significant retreat in my life where, you know, uh, I'm, I'm into that psychological existential stuff. And so a lot of that was going on on this retreat, three weeks, solitude, you know, tons of self-discovery. It was beautiful. Um, it's another way to, yeah, <laughs> to know yourself. Yeah, yeah, another way to know yourself. <laughs> Go be alone for three weeks. Right? But uh, at any rate, uh, this painting uh, she gave to me as a birthday present and I was kind of asking her, she's like, can I please have this painting? Can I please have this painting? I love it, you know? And she gave it to me and it will always remind me of that season of my life where I was discovering yeah. how to be, how to be me, who I am, whatever, you know, like, and this painting, I, I love, for one thing, I just think it's beautiful and interesting and, you know, abstract and mysterious and everything, but it also then carries the story of a significant moment in my life for discovery. Yeah. So, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so. really cool. So I think we're coming to our final insight. Yep. So third and final insight, babe, what, what else have you kind of gleaned from these conversations it stands out yes the third one is um largely what this podcast like i had a hint that this would be important but i think it's proven to be true that cross-cultural perspectives global perspectives on a home would be important to get because they're going to carry a lot more um a lot more rich insight um so for example yeah tell me more about it getting to talk to melica and hearing about her life in iran was so valuable to me Living in the United States, there's a narrative played out on the news about Iran and what life's like there and everything. And one of the things that um, I experienced in her conversation was just how completely normal her life felt. And there, she had you know words to say about her you know government and you know, all these kinds of things. And I really really value that. Um, and also, she's like she's got cats, she's got a kitten, and she's got plants, and she's got a mom who's cooking great food for her, and she's you know uh, trying to figure out how to become a freelancer and. And I swear, like that, I could have heard that story from just about anybody in the world. Um, and so, what I'm realizing in taking in these cross cultural perspectives is, one home is home is home everywhere, on some level. Doesn't matter if you 
live in Iran or San Francisco or Phoenix or Copenhagen, people all want a place to call home mm -hmm. where they belong and um, can rest and be inspired and be connected to the people that they love, whatever it might be. Um, so that was like the you know kind of first point that I realized in talking to Malika mm -hmm. is I was expecting it to be like drastically different, crazy conversation, or whatever. But then it was all so normal and like a conversation I'd have with our neighbor, um, you know, down the hall from us. Um, the second big thing though that I'm seeing this cross cultural perspectives on home is how valuable immigrants' perspectives are in really looking at home. So talking with Brian, uh, he, he was born and raised in Denmark and has now moved to the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, talking with Ali, born in the Philippines when she was really young, moved to Toronto. Um, the, their cross-cultural, cross-ethnic experiences of home are really, um, the, you know, really, really fascinating hmm. um, because uh, it does tell a little bit about the difference. As much as, like, everybody wants a home and everybody's, like, kind of the same on, on yeah. some human levels, there's also these differences uh, that do come from cultural norms in yeah. different places. Uh, for example, we already talked about it, but like the uh, Danish way of being at home where, uh, you know, you, you <laughs> it was so crazy talking to Brian. Like he said, when you're in Denmark, you, um, you know, you, you wear your jeans, you wear your button up shirt, you're always put together, even at home. And, and he's said like moving to the United States, like now it's like you wear your sweatpants and you know, you want to be comfortable and athleisure wear and whatnot. Yeah. And, and that is a difference that I wouldn't have known was a difference. Sure. Unless, um, you know, unless I came to it. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was a fascinating connection. Yeah. That's so interesting too, because I think, yeah, this is, I feel like always true when I, when I travel or experience, um, different cultures or, or, um, yeah, even, I mean, a wide variety of, of like cultural differences, whether they're like, uh, national differences, traveling, that kind of thing, or family culture or different spaces is just the things that we like both the universality of like some things, um, the things that are kind of human experience. And then also like the vastly different, things that we take for granted. I think that's the interesting part about it is it's like, oh, we, I don't think about how our couch is comfortable or that I change out of my jeans when I come home from work or, you know, during the pandemic, I've never wore jeans. Exactly. <laughs> um, but just like that, that's like a cultural way of experiencing home. Like, I, I wouldn't have thought about that. Right. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of those things that you don't experience until you're in another space. And then you're like, oh, this is different. You know, like I, one of the experiences I've had is, um, a lot of some cultures don't have like the we have a huge emphasis on like privacy um yes as americans yes. we have and a so right to privacy we have a right to privacy space, we think about privacy and so in our homes even within our homes there's like certain spaces that are like you don't go into the bedroom you don't do like if you're whatever and so one of the things like having you know done even short cross-cultural living um in in our cultural spaces is like oh yeah they just like come into your room and go through stuff and like in certain places and it's normal like it's not like a, an affront to my space you yeah. know and i'm a pretty open person so it didn't it's okay. Oh, yeah, but that, I think that would bug me so much. I, I, don't, I would not like that one bit. I don't just, like when somebody just like comes into my bedroom, period. Right. right. Like other than yeah. you. Yeah. Even, so I think there's like, but to recognize that the ways that we hold those spaces like are kind of cultural. And so um, even to negotiate or, or engage with like possibilities or options that we might not think are options, right? Like we just don't even think of those things as we don't see them as a thing at all because it's just part of the way that we live and experience life. Yeah. Um, and so it, you know, like, could we, I, I don't know. I guess it just makes me think, like, how do we, when we're kind of discovering our own space, because I'm trying to yeah. translate this into our own space. And part of it is, like, um, understanding the things that we take for granted. Um, but also, the thing, I think, like, maybe there's a little bit of navigating that in relationship where you're like, oh, for example, I have this, like, desire for, I mean, this is maybe more self-expression, but, like, color and, like, this place, to, the space to feel warm and colorful and whatever. And you were, like, minimal, you know? Got to make yeah. it minimal. And then we yeah. had to try to find something in between. But I guess... You, even just like being in conversation, not just with the person that you're living with, but um, even express like discovering like, okay, what are the different types of ways that we can live? And I think, you know, you by exploring people's experiences that are really different from your own, it can also bring like freedom into your options and possibilities. I mean, I think even thinking about like living in an apartment and um, having grown up in a house um, in like in the US, you know, it wasn't huge, but it was like it was a house with multiple rooms and a downstairs and stuff, you know, and um and having traveled to being in so many small places and very different types of small places, but seeing what people do with it and how they use it and how it still is home, it makes our apartment feel palatial. I mean, some, yeah. in some, but it also is like, okay, how do we use space, you know, to create that sense of like communion and together and whatever. So anyway, yeah, I'm just yeah. thinking about that. I, I don't know if I have a takeaway exactly yet on how we would do that in our space, but sure. I'm just kind of thinking it. Through. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one thing that 
you know, you, you've practiced immigration law for, you know, a long time. And like one of the things that you have brought to the table in our relationship is this global perspective, recognition of the immigrants' experience, cross-cultural experiences, all of that. And um, it's been amazing to have in our lives. And it is something that I think gets embodied in, um, you know, some of the artwork that we have hanging in our home, but also uh, the the folks that we invite over to our home. I think we, yeah. because of the way that you lead, I think you have an ex- a special interest in inviting cross-culturally different people, you know, being hospitable to cross-culturally different people. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that could be like a real clear actionable, you know, piece for this is... Yeah. Even, Sitting around the table yeah. at your home with people with different experiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like I'm, I've got like a list of people who, you know, I've met who are from France or from Denmark or from Finland or from, you know. Um, Europe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not just Europe. Right, got it. There's but, other places too. Got it. Got it. But uh-huh. but like the key thing being like I want to like invite them over. Yeah. You know, and have the Learn. little fun foreign exchange experience uh, of hospitality. So, yeah. um, you know what? We got to wrap this episode because our baby's crying. <laughs> it's time. And that we got through all of it anyways. So. Started last Tuesday, So we yeah, got it. Yeah. The baby's crying. Got to go get her. Um, but. Yeah. If you like this, uh, like we said, this will be the kind of episode that you'll get during the, uh, if you're a premium subscriber in the future. Like we're just giving it away at this point because we're generous people. <laughs> so and that's generous. the thing that we stand for. It's one of our values. <laughs> Also, though, um, you know, we'll be doing more research. So there will be yeah. these insights will be coming from more and more interviews and research um, mm-hmm. to gather more people's perspectives. So as we're talking at the end, a little bit about just the value of diverse perspectives. Yes. Like you're actively gathering those right now. And it'll be fresh every time. You know, it'll be new yeah. things every time. And I can't wait because I love learning new things and I love <laughs> sharing them with you. So please sign up to be a premium subscriber so you can get access to this and uh, sign up for the Home Life Design Lab newsletter at homelifedesignlab.com. Com. I was about to say .org for some reason, but it's, it's .com. Not, it's .com. <laughs> um, check the links in the show notes. That's where you'll find all the info. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. See you next time.